Hi, my name is Kevin Thomas, W1DED. Kevin Stockton, N5DX, appears to be the unofficial winner of the ARRL DXCW contest from this past weekend in the single operator, all band, high power category. But this isn't his first number one win. He's had several in the single operator category. He's also competed as part of multi operator teams at KC1XX as well as K1LZ in Maine. What intrigues me the most, though, is his longtime relationship with a station in the Catskills owned by N2QV and WU2X. He's won several contests from that station, some in person, some remote. Kevin, thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Well, this all came together pretty quickly. I appreciate you being able to respond so fast. I think that we put this together within 24 hours. So uh, thanks for your flexibility. Yeah, you bet. Like when something pops up, I'm just, let's, let's do it as soon as possible. <laughs> it's kind of always my, my motto. Let's get it done. I like that attitude. Well, let's start with the DX contest from this past weekend, since that's obviously fresh in your mind. Uh, you, you posted one hell of a score. You uh, beat out N6MJ and K5ZD. Tell me an overview of that experience. You know, like just from the conditions, you know, everybody's talked about how great they were and they were just phenomenal. I mean, like the I very well could have just been, I'm a big Arkansas Razorback basketball fan. I could have ended up watching a basketball game that weekend and missing out on, you know, like one of the probably best conditions for a week at contest weekend ever. So just being able to to be on and to experience that and then to, to put up a, a big score was just something I was kind of really appreciative to do. Um, you know, 160 and 80 were really, really big surprises. I mean, Operating from the East Coast, you know, Europe is always loud, but I mean, they were even louder. You know, like, you know there's there's 100 watt guys on 80 meters that are S9 or louder and, you know, same on 160. So just overall, the, the, the conditions were, were incredible. And I didn't really know too much going in to expect as far as competition goes. Like I, I knew... I knew Dan would be on, be on, and you know he's he's like the man basically <laughs> when it comes to all of this. But he's way the heck out there in W seven, so I mean that's tough to compete, almost impossible to you know compete with with East Coast guys. It can happen every once in a while, but it's really hard way out there to do that. And then I knew Randy would be on, and uh, Friday I went to take a nap Friday afternoon before the contest, and. I check the the online, the, you know, the scoreboard a lot, even before the contest. I'm like, okay, who's going to be on? And I see WA1Z on there. It's like, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> this guy's really good, and he's on from a massive station from KC1XX. So, you know, that was that was exciting to, to see him pop up there. I saw in your summary that you were after a record and then realized that WA1Z was at your heels, and you – sort of changed focus to just stay ahead of him. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, I've been operating from into QV for a long time and we've had lots of low sunspot years where you're working, you know, the low bands and 20 and maybe 15 open. So these last few contests, I've just thought this is the time to be on. You got to take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, with two BSIQ, the way it is now, it really makes, it makes it getting at those old records very doable. I mean, you know, K0DQ obviously really, really good. He's had the record for a long time, but you know, 2 BSIQ wasn't around then. So it, it, it definitely a game changer when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, I definitely thought that that beating that record and maybe somewhere around 9 million was was pretty doable. And But, yeah, then then, <laughs> then I saw that you know, WA1Z and I went back and forth the over the evening. And then, you know, I looked up there Saturday morning. I was like, Oh crap, this guy's beating me. And he's, it seems like he's pulling away. Um, so definitely had to just, you know, just had to refocus and say like, you know, you, you want to be here. You want to say you're competitive. You, 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 you know, you want to say that you're all about competition. Well, <laughs> you've got it now, you know, what are you going to do about that? So, so yeah, I mean the, the the goal going in was maybe around nine million, and then you know conditions were just were just nuts throughout the whole weekend. And just so uh, listeners will know, um, if they don't, 
WA1Z ended up dropping out of the contest after some health issues and, uh, from what I understand, uh, lost an amplifier. So he had a, he had a step away uh, that left uh, Kevin N5DX and Randy K5ZD and Dan N6MJ as the unofficial first, second, and third place in the category. Kevin, I'm curious how you plan for a contest such as the ARRL DXCW. I mean, you've obviously won a lot of major contests, so I, I'm suspecting you don't take this casually. What, what did you do to get prepped for this past weekend? Well, in the past, I'm a little embarrassed about what I did to prep for this weekend, honestly. I mean, in the past, I I really had to learn this skill of 2 BSIQ, and I would set a goal for myself to make um, 10,000 practice contests leading up to a contest. And I put together a database of specific low power and QRP European call signs and, you know, spend a long time practicing those and, you know, keeping a record of it. You know, I can go back several years and I can see what I did here or there. So I did that a lot. And honestly, lately, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, like, I haven't been pushing myself like I wish that I, that I would have, but as far as getting ready for this contest, since it was remote, you know, one of the big things I wanted to do was just do a whole bunch of on-air practice. You know, I think that even if you're in person, a, a you know, a good thing to remember is, you know, you, you got to try everything out, every single combination of different bands and different antennas, and you, you need to try it out. And I've always sort of had this mantra of, I'm going to try and break something. Like, like before the contest starts, I want to try and break something, you know, like, because, you, you know, you definitely don't want that to happen during the contest. So I did a lot of on air, just getting on and trying to do dual CQing and working the different bands and that sort of thing um, to get ready. And the, the other thing that I really, really, it's just kind of fun to do is I like to go back and look up 3830, you know, like go back and read K0DQ's post from, I think it was 2013 or 2014. And then uh, K3LR's posts are a really great resource because he's there every year. You know, he's got great ops and great antennas and you can see his hourly breakdown. And so, you know, the other thing is, so you can go back and you can look and say, okay, this is what they did in this year. And then I'll go on to the, um, I've kind of become a spaceweather.com junkie on their website, <laughs> you know, to, to just watch and see what, what the, the solar flux and the A and K is going to be and all that stuff. And that's a pretty cool resource because you can go in there and plug back in dates from 2013 or 2014. So you can see what those numbers were during that time. So one of the things that I kind of got out of it was, you know, when when um, when Scott K zero DQ set the record, you know, the the conditions were really good, and twenty was open throughout the night, which doesn't always happen. So you could I could go back and look and see what those numbers were on spaceweather.com, the solar flux and all that stuff, and it's like comparing them to what they were supposed to be for this contest. Is it was pretty evident that you know twenty would be open all night. So that was something kind of good to have going into the contest as far as like a kind of like trying to make a mental picture of, okay, how are things going to work out, you know, particularly for the first six, 12 hours, that sort of thing. Um, one other thing I like to look at is the RBN a lot. You know, I heard, I listened to other interviews. I heard Dan talk about how ND 7 k has their own skimmer set up and um, 4U1UN has a beacon, you know, in New York city and, the N2 QB station is pretty close to New York City. So you know, I could go in and I could see, okay, when are they hitting Europe on 20 meters or whatever? And you, sure enough, you could see it was all through the night. So, you know, just kind of, just basically kind of doing a little bit of research and kind of getting in my head, okay, where am I going to be at this time? And try, just trying to get an idea for, for what things would be like. So, Kevin, I'm, I'm assuming that you operate a remote. Is that right? You're in Arkansas operating Catskills remote. Tell me about what that setup looks like. What do you, I know there are various combinations for remote work. What do you use for N2QV? We have a, we have a K3 on site. And we have a TS-890 on site. 
And so I have a K3 here sitting in front of me where I am in Arkansas. And I have a, a TS590 at Kenwood. And those, my, my radios here communicate with the radios there in, in New York. Um, we also use um, our remote desktop so that I can go in and I can see, I can see the amplifier panel. So, you know, I can see, um, I can see that um, we're using green heron so that I can, which, you know, controls the antennas over the, over their net. So, you know, I can switch to different antennas. Um, and then I use N1MM logger and I have that here locally. And I don't know, through the magic of internet and TCP, and I, it, all that's kind of above my head, but <laughs> in one of them here, I, I type in here on my in one of them here and it sends what I type there and, you know, makes the, the radios going to transmit it. I mean, it's a, I, I'm giving a very layman's overview of it because that's pretty much the only view I have of it. But <laughs> so, so you, um, you have a full K3 there, dot a K3 mini. Right. That's right. And I guess I'm curious, why, why don't you have two Elecrafts instead of an Elecraft and a Kenwood side by side? Is there any particular reason you, for that? I mean, they, the, the N2QV station, like, you know, we're, I'm on in contests, but they they get on a lot and just play DX, Tariq N2QV and Scott W2X, and they like the Kenwood 890. Um, so that's just, just kind of always, kind of always been that way. It's a, I guess it's kind of a deal where it's worked and, you know, why change it? We did, we did set up two K threes in the, in the CQ or wide CW contest. Um, the K three has a, a thing I use a lot is diversity reception and you, you can't beat the K three in diversity reception. That's really, really helpful. But so, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, kind of their preference. They like to have that, that, that kin with there. So tell me more about the Cat Skills Station. I mean, I, I've been vaguely aware of it. Um, I think I actually listened to the owner on, a, on some sort of Wall Street podcast, and he yeah. he mentioned ham radio. It's like I, I, yeah. I practically stopped my car. It's like what, what's going on here? This uh, this guy on Wall Street's got a uh, remote station. Uh, so I did a little bit of research and uh, found out a little bit of information, but not a lot. Uh, tell me, tell me the the genesis of that and how that came to be. So were you just listening to this podcast and then out of nowhere, he mentioned the station? hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> it started out as just, you know, Tariq has a, a place with a decent amount of land and, you know, it just started off as he wanted a place to just play radio and DX and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think he started off with something pretty modest, at least compared to what he has now. And then, um, he, he put up his first, I'm, I may get this a little mixed up, but he put up his first big tower, which is 150 feet. And there's four uh, tri-banders on that that W2X is designed and built. And so that's what he has for the high bands. Um, and, you know, and then at some point, I think Tariq wanted to kind of upgrade a little bit and you know, like, I think it was sort of like Scott was talking to him. He said, you might as well kind of go all out, you know, like, why not? So for 40, they put up a 180 foot tower that has full size four over four on it. And then I was living, my, my dad, K5GO and I were working on building these, these, um, tribe i'm going to kind of get off topic i'll try and swing back though <laughs> we're working on building um the, the tribanders for the wrtc in 2014 and scott w2x was des the designer of those tribanders so my dad and scott knew each other real well and i moved my family and i moved back from the cayman islands in 2015 and scott was like hey why don't you come and operate the station and i was like oh that's cool. I've always wanted to operate from there. And at the time, they didn't even have an, a 160 antenna. They put up an inverted L in the trees. And, you know, I, I, I came, that was 2015, maybe, CQ Worldwide CW. And, you know, showed up not having any real expectations as far as what's going to happen. 
Um, and I don't know, like it still feels kind of like a fluke or whatever, but ended up beating three guys that were in Maine, three really well-known guys in Maine and winning the thing, which was just kind of definitely not expected at all. Um, so, yeah, and then so, you know, we, we we had that success and that really lit a fire under them. They, they put up this just incredible 160 meter four square that just just is, works phenomenal from there. And, you know, we've added some uh, receive antennas, phase beverages to the northeast work really well. And Tariq just put up some phase beverages to what to the west. They work great. But, you know, the, the, the I think the really unique thing about this station is pretty much everything is on two towers and which is way different than most stations. You know, you, you go to these big stations and there's 10, 12 towers and, and all that. And they, but, but this setup works phenomenal for them. Works, works really well. And Kevin, was it always designed to be a remote station from, from the day one in 2015? I think so. I think that was kind of the thing was, you know, Tariq, will go there and operate in person, but I think he wanted to, you know, just be able to get on and, and, and work DX. And as far as contesting goes, you know, we, we had that success from that first contest and that would, would have been CQ wide CW. And then this was like a few weeks before ARL contest. This is back in 2015, 2016. This guy said, well, you know, you could probably work this thing from your house. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, like how, how, <laughs> and, you know, it, for the most part, it, it, it worked pretty well that, that very first time. So you may know, I'm just recently back into the hobby, so I don't know the answer to this. Back in 2015, was remote that popular? Were there very many remote stations? I don't think contest wise, there were, there were too many at all. I mean, I'm sure that there were, you know, there's, you never know exactly what's going on everywhere and DXing and contesting and that sort of thing. I mean, I had a, I had a friend back from Arkansas a long, long time ago, K5 ALU who was doing remoting back in the early two thousands, but that was just to get on and rag you, you know, but as far as serious contesting goes, I, I don't think anybody else was, was doing it back then. So was my earlier statement accurate? Were you the first to win a major contest remote? I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I, I would hate to say, because I don't even know which one that would have been. I, I guess I guess we won WPX in 2016, maybe. And that one was remote. I know some guys in Europe had been doing some remoting as well. Well, I appreciate your modesty. So may, maybe you weren't the first, <laughs> but you were definitely at the beginning of the uh, now pretty commonplace trend. And when you, right. when you read about these multi-ops that are uh, operating... 50% remote or sometimes 100% remote. So 2015, that win sounds like it was somewhat of a surprise to you and Tariq and to Scott, but that started a streak for you, right? Didn't you win several contests from that station since 2015? Yeah, I mean, we've had really good success in CQ Worldwide CW. I'm not, you know, that, that that's worked out really well in lots of other contests as well. But, but yeah, I mean, that... I, just, I don't know. I, I still get, <laughs> I don't know. Like every, every time before I, before I uh, get on and operate, I kind of think like, what the heck am I doing? I got to remember everything. And I, I sort of forget about all the things we've done in the past. And, you know, it's still particularly sometimes in these, you know, if you're going up against somebody in Maine or, or you're in a 160 contest and like, how the heck are we going to compete with these guys? You know, it just seems like they they're they're in a better spot geographically, and we know they've got really big antennas. But uh, thing, things work really well, really well from there. I mean, there's their 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 forty meter stack has probably a really slight drop off for maybe I don't know eight hundred feet, a thousand feet, and that little that little terrain there, I'm convinced. Obviously, 404 is going to work well, right? But I'm convinced that little terrain makes that work just way better than you would ever think it should. It's just <laughs> kind of one of those things. Scott, so we've established the CQWWCW. Um, it sounds like that may be your favorite contest because you, you've performed really well in that. But do you also 
uh, do phone contests? I actually like phone contests better. I was I don't know why I always end up operating CW. I think I, I know, growing up in my household, like you know, phone was like a four letter word. Um, and so, you know, my dad is pretty much an all CW guy. So I didn't operate that many phone contests, but I've always felt like I'm a much better phone operator than CW operator. I mean, I still can't remember S's and H's when it comes to CW and all that kind of stuff. I mean, gee whiz, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I really like phone contests, but I, I end up for whatever reason, gravitating towards a CW contest and then the phone contests are usually kind of like an afterthought as far as, okay, am I going to operate that or not? So since you mentioned your dad, obviously you grew up in a ham radio family. Uh, when did you get your first license? I was 13 years old when I got my license. Um, didn't want to do it. I, <laughs> I, he, you know, he took me to this place where they're, you know, they're teaching how to do it. I'm 13 years old. And I'm not, I don't have the, the mind that a lot of ham radio operators do. So the whole math and all science, and I'm just kind of like zoning out. And, you know, I told him I didn't want to do it. And then he's a pretty persistent. He probably encouraged me, but, you know, I think he was fine with it to a certain degree. And I came back and got my license and then, <clears throat> you know, just stuck with it. And I heard, heard Dan talking about the novice roundup in your last um, interview. And that's one of my, things I remember is doing the novice roundup, you know, with my dad, and, you know, his dad also was a ham radio operator and that's where I got my call sign from. It's definitely some consistency between you, Dan, Randy, K5ZD, Chris, KL9A, you all started very young. So you've been at this for a while. Yeah. I heard, uh, I was listening to your, to your, to your video in the car on the way home day. And Chris, I heard Chris say something about how like his first pile up, he, you know, he, wanted to quit. And his dad's like, Oh, come back and do that. I, I was just making me think, I remember, I think it was maybe my first DX station was a French guy. I worked on 15 and I don't know, I couldn't copy it or whatever. And you know, like I got all pissed off and walked away and quit. Yeah. That was a great story. I think he was talking about sending it seven words per minute or something. And uh, yeah, his dad sat him back down. You're going to keep doing this. So what's the next contest on your list? I've worked more contests than I normally do. And it's just because I don't know when these conditions are going to happen again. You know, maybe we'll have them for the next three years and maybe we won't. Um, I'd like to work ARL sideband. I should just commit to it, but I don't know. I have commitment issues sometimes when it comes to contests. And <laughs> well, Kevin, I <laughs> love how casual you are about this. I, I might, I might not, I guess I'll do it. And then you, you turn in these fantastic scores. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm just being, you know, W2X has asked me, he's like, are you trying to qualify for WRT, WRTC now? I'm like, I don't know, honestly. I'm just, I'm just trying to operate contests right now. And, you know, if it happens, it happens. But I know I would have really regretted not operating last weekend. And I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe ARL phone. Who knows? It may not be on until CQ or wide sideband in October. <laughs> well, I hope to be in the ARRLDX phone, so hopefully I'll hear your call sign on the air. Kevin, I really appreciate you taking time on short notice to spend a few minutes with me tonight. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I've been talking to Kevin Stockton, N5DX. Hopefully you'll hear him along with me two weekends from now on the ARRLDX phone contest. And if you want to check out some of his records, go to 3830 Scores, and I promise I'll figure out if he actually was the first remote contester to win a major contest. I believe he was. Thank you again.